Blessed be your name.
let the chains fall this morning. Jesus is the Almighty. Jesus is the All-Powerful. Jesus is Jesus. He is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus. 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 privilege and an honor. I sound all right out there? Echo or anything? We're good. Good go. All right. Well, it's, it's just an honor to be able to speak uh, this morning. Anytime I get an opportunity to speak, wh wherever it is, at Mercy House, at a church, I'm always just floored and mind blown because, you know, I remember where I was just not too long ago, you know, and, and where the Lord brought me from. And it, it's nothing short of a miracle that I'm here where I am today. And I give God all the glory for that. And, uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor Wilson and Sister Lynette for trusting me and, and allowing me this, this great opportunity. Um, well, I, I want to pray, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive right into it. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I lift you up in this house. God, we magnify you in this place. God, we let everything else fade to the background, God, and we look to you today. Lord, have your way, God. I'm nothing but a vessel to be used by your mighty hand. Use my mouth as a mouthpiece to speak your word. Let it go forth with power and precision. Let there be conviction and change come about in this place today, Lord. I love you so much, and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So how many of us know that our spiritual health is everything? You know, how we're doing spiritually is the most important aspect of our life. If we're dry and dead spiritually, it's going to affect everything that's connected to us. The fact is, the further that we get away from God, the more trouble we're going to have in life. The more stresses and difficulties and adversities. Why? Because we're not cooperating with the God who created us. Amen? On the other hand... The closer we get to God, the, the more transformed and fulfilled our life is going to be. The more purpose we're going to have on our life. We see this all throughout scripture. Uh, Paul, you know, he, he, he got close to his creator and, and was transformed from a murderer and a terrorist into the apostle of love who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Isaiah got close to God and he was transformed from a depressed person to courageous. Moses, when he got up close to his creator, the Bible said he was even transformed in his appearance. When he came down from the mountain, spending time with the father, it said his face was glowing from the glory of the Lord. Peter, he was a knucklehead, but he was so close to God that his shadow was literally healing people.
Now, I know everybody in here today, you, you want to be close to God, um, or you wouldn't be in this church service this morning. Teen Challenge, guys, I know somewhere deep within you, you want God's will fulfilled in your life, or you wouldn't be in the program. No matter how much you buck and you kick, somewhere within you, there is a desire and a yearning to know God because he put that in you. He put that in all of us. There is a God-shaped hole that only God can fill in our life. But the Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. We all tend to stray at times. And if you want to put a title on this message, it's simply getting back to God. You don't have to teach a sheep how to wander. They do it naturally. <laughs> and the shepherd's got to bring them on back into the sheepfold. They're not the brightest animals on the planet. Amen. <laughs> See, our natural tendency as fleshly humans is not to be up close to God because we have the, our desires waging war against our flesh and trying to pull us to the things of this world. So we're constantly fighting that fight of faith. But the truth of the matter is, if you and I are going to be honest, I don't care how long we've been walking with the Lord, at times we stray away and we drift. So just for a moment this morning, you guys, I want to talk to us about how to get close to God, how to stay close to God, and if you've drifted away, how to get back to God. Fortunately, we have a passage of Scripture in the Bible that highlights this beautifully for us. It's the story of the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, verse 11 through 24, I'll read it to you. It says this, Jesus continued, there, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods and the pigs were eating, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy, worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son, uh, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is, and is found. So they began to celebrate. This story tells us that we all tend to wander away from the God who loved us and created us. The son starts off by saying in verse 11, I want you to give me all that is mine, all that belongs to me. It started to become all about him. Pride is the first sign that we are getting away from God. We start living life like it's all about me, myself, and I, and not about God and all that he desires for my life. Listen to me. When we take our eyes off of God and put it on ourself, destruction is around the corner. Proverbs 16, 18 says pride goes before the destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. First Peter 5, 5 said God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. How many of us know that people that loves us aren't the ones that sees us going down a path of destruction and doesn't say anything to us or hold us accountable. The person who really loves us is the one who gets in between us and the edge of the cliff and resists us so that we don't go over. Amen? 
Look, Jesus, the, the word here is saying that God resists the proud. God loves us so much that he resists us because he knows if we continue down that path, destruction is inevitable. The prodigal son's pride had him away from the father, eating pig slop, homeless at his wit's end. And the Bible says he wises up. In the story, I want to point out three things for us this morning to get us back to true intimacy with God. How many of us in here want to be as close to God as you can possibly be? The first thing is we must get fed up. We got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We got to just get tired of living the way we've been living. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. But yet we look around our life and we wonder why our marriage is erect and our life is the way it is. But we keep doing the same thing we've always, we've always done. That's insanity. That's insanity. We got to get tired of whitewashing ourselves like the religious Pharisees did, walking around as, you know, a tomb full of dead man's bones with no joy and no contentment and no peace, putting on our Sunday best and our, our bright white smile, but inside we're dead. We got to get tired of living that way, faking it, get fed up with that. The Bible says in James 4, 17 through 18, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. We need to let our faith move us to action. We can't pray our way out of something we behaved our way into. We need to repent and turn and go a different direction. Amen? Amen. Listen, let me give you some application here. If you stop doing your devotion and reading your Bible, maybe it's time to get the alarm clock set in an hour early, get up and get back to the basics. Amen? Amen? If you stop doing, you know, stop spending time with Jesus because you're so consumed with social media and scrolling Facebook and you're on there more than you spend time with Jesus, may it simply, maybe it's time to shut it down for a little bit. Listen, where would we be in our walk with God if we reached for God as much as we reach for our telephone? Come on now. You know, he wants to be the very thing that we go to bed at night and we daydream about. He wants to be our source of entertainment. He wants to be our center focus. He wants to be our all in all and everything. We must get fed up with whatever it is in our life. And everybody in here have something pulling at you. We all do. We all have these elements of our life um, that are covered up, that are, that are secret sins in our life. And they keep pulling us away to the Father. And we know we need to do something about it. But we just continue down that path. I'm here to tell you today, today is the day to get fed up, to turn from that thing and get back to the feet of Jesus. Amen. We must get fed up with whatever it is in our life causing us to be separated from our Heavenly Father. We have to get desperate and hungry. In that passage, it says he wasted it all, had nothing left. He got desperate and hungry and finally came to his senses. Let me ask you, are you there yet? Are you as desperate today as you were when you first got saved? See, God will send some rain, then he'll send a little more rain then he'll send a, a full out storm. Why? Because he loves us too much to let us stay where we are. You know, the storms the Lord allows in our life isn't meant to destroy us. It is meant to wake us up from our spiritual slumber that we might turn back to him and get desperate for him and serious about him once again. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you'll find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. I was thinking about an illustration and I thought of a man or a woman in a mall, in a crowded mall with a child next to them. And all of a sudden you see that your child is missing, lost in the crowd, nowhere to be found. And 
what would you do in that moment? I know that I would be laser focused and tunnel vision and I would do whatever it took to get that child back into my arms. See, we need to pursue God with that same type of tenacity and resilience that he's the very thing missing in our life because he is. If you don't know him this morning, I don't know where you are, but I'm here to tell you that he is the very thing missing in your life. There's nothing this world can offer you. There's no temporary satisfaction or instant gratification that can offer you what Jesus can offer you. He's the one that can satisfy. There's no better investment with a greater return than our relationship with Jesus Christ. Men, you're in the program today, and I'm telling you, you're, you're making the wisest investment that you will ever make. The fruit that's going to come out of this season in your life is going to be life transforming. It's going to pave the path to your destiny. If you'll just hold on, don't lose heart and give up. Stay planted. Bloom where you're planted and trust the process. Don't get caught up in all the details and allow God to do what he wants to do in your life. In verse 17, it says he came to his senses. He said he, he sinned against God. See, the next thing we got to do is we got to own up to where we are. We got to own up to how we've been living. We got to realize, see the, see the son here in this passage realized that he finally realized it's insanity to try to live out from under the covering of my father. Here I am in pig slop, eating pig slop, and uh, what am I doing? This is insanity. See, when we get away from God and out from underneath his covering, it is crazy. It is insanity. Let me ask you, have you come to the place in your life that you, you realize that it is crazy to try to live this life without God? Because it is. You know, we, you know, the Bible says that we've given power to tread over serpents and scorpion over all the power of the enemy. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. But when we're not walking with God and we have things in our life that has put distance between us and him and we're out from underneath that covering, we are vulnerable to the enemy. If you're away from God this morning, I don't know where you are. I, you know, I have no idea, but God laid this message on my heart. So I know that somebody under the sound of my vo voice this morning, you're not where you need to be with God. And I'm telling you right now, nothing is going to change into your life until you own where you are. And you come to your senses and realize the way you're living without God is insanity and it's crazy. And death and destruction is inevitable. You need to, you and I, we need to resign from general manager of the universe and give God his rightful place in our life. Amen. We need to get out of the, the pilot, the pilot seat and let God take over because I know when I'm driving the bus, we going in a ditch. Amen. I proved that time and time again. And Darla said, amen. <laughs> But see, if, if you and I, if we, if we feel far from God, guess who moved? You did. God didn't go anywhere. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your sins have separated you from your God and have hidden his face from you. That separation comes from unrepented, habitual sin in our life. You moved away by giving your love to something else. You forsaken your first love, which is idolatry. Idolatry is making something or someone that to which we look to to bring happiness, peace, fulfillment, contentment, and all the things only God is supposed to provide us. It could be in the form of a career, material possession, money, drugs, or even a relationship. But something you and I can never deny is that things will never satisfy us. Every time we find, try to find joy and peace and fulfillment in things, it leaves us stranded in the, de in the desert. See, idolatry, these idols in our life, they bring about temporary 
happiness, but it's a fleeting moment of existence. When the new wears off the chandelier, the happiness goes with it. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is the only one that can offer eternal, lasting joy and satisfy our soul. He's got to be our portion. He's got to be our everything. He's got to be the one we run to when we're in need. Amen? John 4, 13 through 15 says, says this. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy that thirst. He's the only one that can quench it. See, the enemy wants to deceive us into thinking that, you know, this temporary fix or this instant gratification, that, that's where I'm going to find fulfillment and joy. But see, he is a liar. All he's trying to do is wrap you in the chains of bondage and hold you captive to do his will. If there's someone in this house this morning and you are wrapped in chains, I'm going to tell you, look to Jesus who breaks every chain. There is no match for him. Cancer is no match for him. Addiction is no match for him. I'm living proof that he can take a junkie and turn him into a preacher. Amen. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. I tried it my way. I tried to do it on my own with no avail. Stuck back in the same cycle over and over again. It wasn't until I met Jesus that I found freedom. And that was five years ago. Come on, somebody. He's faithful. And I'm telling you this morning, wherever you are, whatever you're involved in, whatever you're wrapped in, it is no match for Jesus. We should be like the Samaritan woman in, in, in John chapter 4. We should be excited about what the Lord has to offer our life. We should be thrilled about where he's taking us. We never want to lose that excitement. She was waiting, anticipating to drink from the fountain of living water. And there's rivers of living water flowing in this place today. And I'm going to tell you, if you're willing, you can have your dry and thirsty soul quenched today. Amen? You can have that thing quenched today when you don't hunger for the world anymore. When you taste the goodness of God, there is nothing that can compare to that. Amen. We need to stop looking to the world. We need to stop looking for these temporary things and set our mind on things above, not on things of this world. We're living in perilous times and Jesus, he's coming back soon. And I'm telling you, we need to be a bride that is washed in the blood spotless. And we need to quit giving ourselves to these idols and things of this world. Oh. We'll be all right. <laughs> Worst things has happened to me. The Holy Spirit's moving up here. The water fell off the podium, amen. Set that right there. Living water. Come get a drink. <laughs> the fact is, church, is that we're as close to God as we need to be. We need to stop blaming everyone and everything else for where we are spiritually. You know, don't we say things like, I'm overworked and underpaid. If there was just more time in the day, I'm just too busy. You know, I just got too much going on. Uh, you just don't know how difficult the situation is. Those people I got to put up with every day, right? Don't look to your neighbor, okay? When I said that, don't look to your neighbor. Just keep looking straight. It starts to become all about me, myself, and I. See, listen, we need to stop making excuses and own it. And own where we are. Realize that we're not where we need to be. And get back to the feet of Jesus. Paul was praising and worshiping God in a prison cell chained to the wall. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret to being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Paul had a revelation that changed his life. He went from a, a prideful disposition to a posture of humility. You know, humility is just an attitude that says, I don't know. God, fix me. I can't fix myself. I don't know. Teach me. 
uh, uh, if anyone had the opportunity to complain, it, it, it was Paul, right? So we just need to own it. We need to get rid of whatever it is, and we need, we need to get back to that intimate place with Jesus. And then finally, we, we need to offer up our life to him, offer up every fiber of our being. We need to give it to him. Luke 15, 12 says the son drifted away, saying, give me my share. Then in verse 19, he says, make me your servant. Wow, what a change, right? He had a drastic change of attitude. He no longer wanted to serve the father for what he could get. Rather, he wanted to serve him for who he was. True transformation comes from when we go from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. Are you there yet, or is it still all about you? Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to test and approve that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. We see in this verse that transformation doesn't come until we have first offered up ourselves. How many of us know the problem with a living sacrifice is that it crawls off the altar? Every day when we get up, I need to be saying to myself, you know, I need to die to myself. Just like, you know, Paul said, I die daily. I need to die daily. I need to take off Carl Williams, hang him on the cross, put on Christ Jesus, and be Jesus with skin on that day. Amen? I want to close. I'm going to go into my closing. If, if we want to start playing uh, that music, please. Um, Isaiah 1, 18 through 19 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. But if you're willing and obedient, you will enjoy the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Listen to me. There is no stain too tough, no deed too dark, that the Lord cannot wipe that away and make it as white as snow this morning. He's not looking for a perfect vessel. He's, he's looking for a willing and obedient one. He's not mad or disappointment. No, he's filled with compassion, and he runs out to meet the sun. He doesn't wait for the sun to get close to him. He takes the initiative. The Lord wants you to know this morning that he desires you more than you desire him. He's not mad at you. He's filled with love and compassion, waiting patiently for you to return to him. He's the good shepherd who will leave the 99 and go get the one. I'm here to tell you today is the day for you to come home. Amen. Stop running. Stop bucking. Stop kicking. Surrender all to Jesus. He won't let you down. He will not lead you astray. He will never lead you in destruction. He will always lead you into triumph. He is a good, good father. And I'm telling you, someone in here today, if that's you, if you've been struggling, 